When one of the greatest investors of all time is asked the question, what should you invest in? His answer goes something like this. And that is to consistently buy an S&P 500 low cost index fund Keep buying it through thick and thin, and especially through thin. <laughs> so no need to pick your own stocks, no need to spend your weekends looking at financial statements, and no need to watch videos on YouTube telling you about the best things to suddenly invest in today, this week, or this month. Is it really that simple? Do we just need to buy the S&P 500 as our index fund of choice, then sit back, relax, and wait? Or should we be looking to carry a lot more of those individual company bags? Do you really need all that? Yeah, I do. Well, how about we take a look at the pros and the cons of just buying the S&P 500 as your index fund of choice. We'll consider the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then I'll give you my opinion on what I think a good course of action might be. Okay, where do we start? May as well do ourselves a quick recap. Now, I know many of you will already know the basics, but let's just get ourselves on the same page. The S&P 500 is probably the most famous stock market index in the world, representing about 80% of the investable companies in the United States. As of right now in 2023, this means that the S&P 500 represents around $32 trillion out of the total market value of $40 trillion for all public companies headquartered in the US. So that's about 80% of the entire market. Now, one thing to note here, although the quick way to describe the index is to say that it's made up of the largest 500 companies in the US, that's not 100% accurate because the index is actually controlled with a little bit of management. So for example, you won't automatically get on the S&P 500 just because you're worth $20 billion for a market cap. You also need to show profitability as well as have enough of your shares publicly traded. In fact, you have to show profitable trading so your last four quarters need to add up to a positive number too. This leads us nicely to one of our first pros of the index. In fact, two things. First off, we've got a well-diversified set of companies because you've got businesses in all parts of the economy. So you have all of your favorite tech stocks leading the way, followed by healthcare, financials, consumer discretionary, industrials, energy, and so on, as you can see. Now, clearly tech leads the way in terms of the weighting with more than 25% of the entire index made up from just a small number of companies that we all know very well and probably use on a day-to-day -day basis, either directly or indirectly. Will this be the same in a few years? Who knows? Either way, the point still stands. It's a well-diversified index, so you don't have to worry too much about making one yourself. And we all know how important it is to make sure you don't keep all your eggs in one basket, at least. I hope you do. I have no idea what he's talking about. Now, leading us on to point two, which I kind of hinted at a moment ago, the index changes over time. This isn't just a list somewhere that's been put together randomly. You have to earn your place on it and keep it. Otherwise, just like on the weakest link, if you keep losing money and can't answer a simple question or say the word bank, you're finished. I can fly higher than an eagle, for you are the wind beneath my what? Feet. Wings. And just like good old Anne Robinson used to keep people in check and change things up, so does the index itself over time. In fact, here's a great comparison for you. Just 20 years ago, this is what the S&P 500 used to look like. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of 2003, I don't really see that as all that long ago, but so much has happened in that time. And when you look at tables like this, you really start to think, wow, things do change very, very quickly. In the top 10 or even the top 20, there's almost nothing that stayed the same. If you try and find any of the big players today, you won't. And the biggest company I could find was Microsoft, and that's 47th in the list. Apple was a tiny company and its share price was just about 50 cents if you adjust the price. Alphabet didn't even IPO until 2004. And how funny is it seeing the likes of Ford and GM right near the top with the likes of Tesla now dominating them in 2023. If I was a stock picker, I'd really take a hard look at this table and ask myself the question, if the company I invest in today is still gonna lead for the next two decades, as I have a suspicion that some of the biggest companies over the next two decades might not have even been started yet. Anyway, the point still stands that the index changes for you and you don't have to worry about making those moves yourself. Now onto performance. The S&P 500 has a long run average return of around 9% per year, which even once you adjust for inflation would have returned you some impressive gains. If we said $10,000 was put in around 1983 and we just left it, we would actually get, in real terms, $222,548, which works out to be roughly 2,225% return over the last 40 years. And if you are curious, without inflation taken into consideration, you end up with almost $700,000. However, aren't we all told that past performance isn't a reliable indicator for future results? Well, yes, and there's no guarantees with investing that you can get the same results over the next 20, 30, or 40 years than we've had in the last one. 
But to counter this, I would at least say that I'd rather invest in something with a century-old track record than something else that hasn't been so strong. And it's not like we can avoid it if you want to be an investor in the 21st century. Not having something invested in the largest market in the world would be taking a pretty big risk in my opinion, and one that I'm certainly not willing to take. Now just one more thing before we talk about some of the downsides, the S&P 500 has proven itself to be extremely tough to beat over the long run. I mean, even in the short term over the crazy bull market we've had, loads of investors haven't even beat it and the numbers really don't lie. I love wheeling these stats out time and time again as a reminder to bring us all back down to earth and here they are. So over the last 10 years, the majority of the best hedge funds and institutional investors have not beaten the return to the market that you or I could have got with a simple index fund. What's worse is that the funds lose both before and after their expensive fees. So once you take that into consideration, it really does make you question the point of buying anything other than index funds. Now, without going too much into the detail, take these bars on the left showing all domestic funds in total. So that's pretty much all the US-based funds that they track. 85% and 86% of the funds have not beaten the market over a 10-year period after fees. You'd think with all that inside information, Bloomberg terminals and all the highly skilled analysts, they could make you loads of money. But in reality, they just aren't saying bank at the right time. And please have a word with them. Susan, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. Anyway, things aren't all rosy. What about the downsides? Well, there's always some cons here. We're just sticking with the S&P 500. And things get a bit more complicated for those of us outside of the US as well, because investing in your local stock market is a bit different to investing outside of it. First things first, we don't know the future and there's no guarantee that the US will continue to outperform as a market. If we look back through the history of the stock market, we'll see that international stocks, when compared to US stocks, are always in some kind of a battle. Some periods, US stocks outperform and in other times, international will do a little bit better. Here's some data from BlackRock going back to 1973, showing us how the US has done against the international markets. As you can see, anytime you see these yellow bars, this means the US has won. Anytime you see these orange ones, international's done better. Now what this shows is that we kind of go in cycles, as you can see, where there's some time periods where you could miss out on his investor if you just pick one or the other. As you can see, two long time periods just before the dot-com crash and between 2003 and the financial crisis, those were great for the international market. If I'm not mistaken, I think that was when the Japanese market especially had a crazy run up. It was only recently that the stock market over there has now actually gone above the levels from the early 1990s, which is just wild to think about if you only had that one in your portfolio. The thing is though, even looking at this, we can't take this as a guide for the future because today is very different from the decade in the past and we're a lot more interconnected and reliant on technology, which is sold globally. So just be careful what you make of this. It's just a reminder though that anything can happen. Now, the next issue is definitely a concern for us UK investors or anyone outside the US, good old currency exchange issues. Anytime we buy the S&P 500 or make an investment, we have to take our pounds and then hope that we get a decent exchange rate. And then on the way out, when we want to sell, we also need to think about that again. When the pound is strong, it might be nice to get lots of dollars to play with, but then when it's weak, we have to pay more for the same stocks. Now, there's not a huge amount we can do here. There are index funds which are hedged to stop the effect of currency movements, but I'm not going to pretend that I'm some kind of expert on them. Everything does have its pros and cons, so you need to investigate that. But outside of this, because the US dollar is so important and it's the key currency that goods are traded in, we're always going to be exposed somewhere, whether we like it or not. For what it's worth, I don't worry too much about this, as in the long run, if you invest regularly over a long period of time, sometimes we'll get a good price and sometimes we'll get a bad one. And then it could work out the same when we sell, sometimes we'll get lucky and other times not so much. I'd rather just focus on getting more money into the market and being careful with my own spending than worrying about something which is completely out of my control. I mean, what are you meant to do if the person before me can't even ask her a simple question? In world geography, the names of two of the continents are North and South where? Asia. The correct answer is America. Now, just jumping back to the earlier points, whether the S&P 500 is a good index to invest in all depends on what happens in the future. The index is now highly concentrated with technology stocks, which now make up a huge percentage of the entire market. And because it's market cap weighted, when we invest, we're putting our money into already very large companies, which might not grow as fast as they have before. It's both a pro and a con, because also if we invest regularly and we dollar cost average, then we always change the price we buy at. So it's not like we have to get lucky once and just hope for the best. As Buffett said at the beginning, you just keep buying through the good times and the bad times, which is always easier said than done. So big question then, will this change the way I invest? And what about your own investments? To S&P 500 or not, that is the question. 
Well, first up, you don't have to do anything and you could just ignore all of this and stick with buying the whole world in a global index fund. You can't exactly avoid the US as the largest market in the world and I'm not sure I'd bet against that trying to guess where the world will be in the next few years or decades. For me personally, I still think that in the long term, regular investing into an index like the S&P 500 will work out well, but I mean long term when I say that and not just a few years. And if you're based in the US, then even better, you don't have to worry about any of those exchange rates or currency differences. Your dollars just get to work and you're all good. However, I do want to diversify a little bit and I already do this as I hold emerging markets and quite a few individual companies too from here in the UK and over in the US. In the next few months, I'm going to definitely simplify a lot of my investing, keeping things well diversified. If anything, the last few years in investing should have taught us just how important that word is and shown us how quickly things can change. Just look at how over the last couple of decades what the market's done. What will the next 20 years bring? I have no idea, but I'm sure whatever happens, it's going to be a bumpy ride. So please keep your arms and legs inside the carriage at all times and hang on for dear life. Oh, and don't forget to say bank. You get better stock market returns if you do that. Or banking. Or oh, banking. Banking. banking, yes. Yes, banking. And if you made it this far, please type bank in the comments. I just want to see how many people actually make it and it will make lots of people very, very confused. Anyway, here's another video for you to watch, which I will leave in the hands of the YouTube gods for you. Anyway, leave a like on the way out, subscribe for more, and as always, happy investing.